Hello, Hello, welcome one and welcome all. Thank you for joining us on Expanding Into Consciousness. I'm your host, Rodrigo Soto. Okay, well, on today's show, we have a very special guest. Uh, we've had her on the show before, and uh, we did get a bit of feedback, and I wanted to hear more about um, the general topics of uh, Billy Meyer. But uh, on today's show, we'll be discussing the Talmud of Emmanuel. Um, welcome, everyone, Vivian Legg of Figure Australia. Hello, Vivian. How are you? Hi, Rodrigo. Thanks very much for having me on. It's a, uh, you know, a wonderful uh, thing to have an opportunity to talk about this. Yes, I'm. I'm glad that you're here because, um, you know, the um, the Talmud of Emmanuel itself was the first um, spiritual, I would say, book that I encountered that led me on the path of discovery, self-discovery. And um, you know, our researching has basically led me to finding about Figure Australia and um, the membership there, and uh, obviously yourself, and having discussions with you about um, um, all things in relation to um, consciousness, as you would say. So, uh, before I sort of you know gave away a bit too much information, can you let us know what the Talmud of Emmanuel is and and who is Emmanuel? Okay, <laughs> that's, that's a, load that's of questions, a so. very big question. I'm glad you've given me a couple of hours to have a try uh, at answering that question. Um, yeah, it's a wonderful place to start. It, it's a huge story and I barely know how to tackle it, but um, it, it's a profoundly important story for Earth humanity. We need to understand who's presenting this story to us mm -hmm. because uh, we don't have an original text that we can analyse. Um, it doesn't exist anymore, although it did once. Uh, the person who translated the text into German from Old Aramaic is no longer alive. Um, and the original translation that was made of part of the text by that man uh, has actually been revised by Billy Meyer and the people associated with him. So mm -hmm. obviously people do need to know something about Billy Meyer to even start to think where that this is worth giving any more thought to at all. There are so many um, you know, texts that are supposedly the true teaching of this and that that emerge. Why is this any different? Why should we give it any attention? Mm -hmm. um, so in a minute I'll, I'll just quite briefly try to give people a, a nutshell you know, explanation of who Billy Meyer is and why it's worth considering. Um, um, well, in fact, I'll do that straight away because that really <laughs> is the next point, if you like. Um, so, so most people who have heard of Billy Meyer know of him because of the time in the 70s and, and into the 80s, but starting in the mid-70s when he produced hundreds of daytime photographs of extraterrestrial craft, beam ships they've been called. Um, and, and these are not little lights in the sky. People who know the pictures know that they are bright daytime pictures, many of them quite close up. We've got frames of reference. We've got next to trees with showing reflections of objects in the vicinity, all sorts of very... You know, too good to be true is usually what they're called. Um, enormous amount of controversy swirls around this case because many people do think they're too good to be true. There are all sorts of elements of controversy have uh, are included in this whole case. Yeah. And um, but this is the story. He, he, he uh, there, there have been you know a whole raft of. Um, investigations into his evidence that were done largely, you know, at, at the time, very, very great scrutiny came upon his case and things were pulled apart at great length and uh, some quite um, noteworthy people have been involved in, in um, investigating the evidence. Anyone who's really interested obviously can go and, and look at that for themselves and that's the point. Nobody else can show you. Nobody else can show um the validity of this case, people really do have to go and have a look for themselves. But um, so he was known for that and, and he got worldwide, um, you know, media coverage for a while before he was branded a hoaxer and fraud and charlatan. Um, and a lot of people just forgot about him. Even people who are interested in extraterrestrials and UFOs tend to avoid him. And the reason is because the content of what he brings um, people is so challenging, so at odds with the usual uh, views about things, um, that it's just unpalatable to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, most people don't know that before the public um, uh, part of his contacts with, with these Pliaran extraterrestrials that started in, in the 70s, uh, he, he was also having contacts right from an early age, from the age of, of five. 
he had a very intensive sort of training from a very elderly man. And then when he was about 16, that training was taken over by a woman called Asket. And she, uh, among other things, she took him to the Middle East and she taught him all sorts of things and showed him all sorts of things. And while he was there, um, in 56, I think it was, there was a man called Issa Rashid, who was a, a, a Greek Orthodox lay priest. So um, he wasn't a full time priest, but he was a priest with a with a Greek Orthodox church. He was moved to go and visit Billy, who was in the Middle East at that time. And he did so. And then as a result of that, he felt compelled to go and very intensively go and try and find the true burial, burial hole of the man, um, Emmanuel, known as Jesus to us now. And um, he did that. He spent six years intensively searching. And when he felt that he'd found what he was looking for, he went back and found Billy again, who was in the Middle East again. This was uh, 63. Uh, he was there on his own this time, having travelled there and been living there for about a year. Um, so Issa Rashid went back to Billy and he took him to the location and together they rummaged around and found a scroll uh, in, encased in resin and a couple of little um, objects, a little um, figurine and a little piece of gypsum, which is a, a mineral um, from Iran. Anyway, obviously... Billy had information about this. The Pliaran were telling him things about this. So there was, you know, they were being led to do this. Um, so the text was found. And during that six-year period, this man, Issa Rashid, had uh, taught himself Old Aramaic. So he began a translation of this text, this text which was uh, um, apparently written by a Judas Iscariot. Um now, there's a lot to say about him because mm -hmm. uh, we will hear that he's not, he was not the betrayer of Emmanuel. Someone with a similar name was. And he was, on the other hand, the only disciple, according to this story, who could write. And so he wrote the text uh, of the story of Emmanuel and his life. Emmanuel, so, who, who was never called Jesus. Right, so the Talmud was written by Judas Iscariot, which um, common day uh, or everyday Christians attribute the betrayal story to him. Yes, yes, Okay. exactly. Okay. So there's quite a story just involved in that, but I, mm -hmm. I probably should leave that a little bit longer. Um, so anyway, Issa Rashid, uh, he translated a, th a quarter of the text uh, very painstakingly with a bit of assistance from a friend who was more fluent in German. Uh, it was going into German because that's the, the language, the, the Billy's uh, language and the language that the and delivered their information in. Um, so he, he created this text, but he was very much a Christian and he ha had grave doubts uh, because the contents of the text didn't coincide with his beliefs. Um, Although at the same time he felt he did want to know and, you know, he felt um, that this was the right thing to do. But he was having pangs of conscience and so forth. Uh, this is the account. All of this that I'm telling you, this story, is all what we've been told by Billy Meyer, um, who has been told various things also by the PR. And so obviously it, it requires uh, a certain trust and respect in Billy to, to start to consider this story. Uh -huh. Um but not only a trust in Billy, it also considers, uh, you also have to consider that there are other frames of reference that you can sort of consider. Anyway, I'm rambling. I'll get back to the point. No, that's okay. You're doing well. Okay. So um, he got nervous. Issa Rashid got nervous. Um, he knew it was a dangerous thing to be doing. He knew this text was uh, extremely controversial and mm -hmm. would not be welcome by the uh the, the people in his uh, religion and, and in the Jewish religion. And in fact, he was pursued in the end. He wound up uh, living under a false name in a Lebanese refugee camp with his whole family. Uh, the story is that he, uh, he put the text into um, a wooden wall, uh, a segment in a wooden wall in the camp in order to hide it. 
And shortly after that, the whole camp was burnt down. It was attacked in uh, one of the Israeli raids and burnt down. And he only escaped, he and his family only escaped by a few hours, I think the story right. is. Were they actually after him for that when they burnt that's, down? That's the story. He, he was sure that he knew he was being pursued by uh, basically fanatical elements from both of those religions. Right. He, he right. could not tolerate this. Um, Heresy, as they would call it. Mm, right. Um, because it does indeed um, put, you know, cast grave doubt on, on the whole accepted story. Yeah. Um, and at that stage, so that there was to... a text, there was uh, an actual physical text that had been encased in, in resin. Resin, right. And he had it. Um, and basically because of the contents would totally shatter the belief systems of uh, the whole world in, in retrospect to um, Judaism, Islam and Christianity. Yes. Mm. Um, so they were aware of this? So he obviously must... Yeah. Yes, it, it was a it was a big deal, and apparently, in the end, uh, a couple of years later, I think it was, um, he was actually killed in Iraq, and I think his whole family was. Wow. So, um, but he did produce a quarter of the text, a translation of a quarter of the text, and he was giving the parts of the text to Billy as he translated them, mm-hmm. and earlier versions of it were published by Figu, which is the organisation that surrounds Billy Meyer. So there are texts out there um, that are the earlier editions, um, but even the ones that are the early editions produced by Figu itself, and don't, certainly don't take any notice of ones that aren't produced by Figu itself, and uh-huh. we have Billy's, you know, Billy's... Uh, Recommendation. Recommendation, <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. Um, even the earlier versions of the texts that are out now uh, apart from the very latest one that's only in German still, um, are in error because not only have we lost the translator and uh, the original text, um, but in 2010 we hear from the Pliaran extraterrestrials that actually he did some fairly serious wrong translations, right. um, partly you know because he just couldn't accept certain parts of the text and just sort of put in things that, he knew from the New Testament instead. All right, so it was his own indoctrination which sort of uh, tainted the actual message that was in the original text. That's right. Mm, okay. And so the question was to Billy, of co- or Billy's question to the Pliaran was, of course, well, how long have you known this? Why didn't you tell us? Surely you would have known this straight away. And their answer was, well, yes, but it was already very dangerous for you. There have been 22 assassination attempts on Billy's life. There have been a lot of witnesses to those. Mm. Um, already his life has been very dangerous because of what he's tried to do mm-hmm. and they felt that if they had an even truer version it would have been even more dangerous. Yes. So that's the explanation that's been given. Uh, meanwhile, we FIGU members have studied the old version and are a little sort of, you know, you, you have to reorganise your thoughts to adapt to the idea that, well, actually, no, even that one was wrong in some ways. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've really only now gotten to the point where I, I've started to really get my head into this new version. Uh, as far as a translation... Yes, well, I, I, you see, I, I, I taught myself German a few years ago. Oh, wow. Okay. Just so that I could get into this material mm-hmm. because so little of it was in English. Mm-hmm. And uh, so now I've been reading the German text. But, of course, there is an official one expected towards the end of this year. Uh, an oh, English good. translation, an official English translation. So, um, you know, I'm not going to start to try and quote verses to you or anything like that because so. I would have to rely on my own inadequate translations. And there are there is a lot of dispute about how different words should be translated, even yes, with the best There are some German words and that don't um, equally translate into English and vice versa, right? Well, English is a, a much more limited language. You can't mm-hmm. get as much precision. And that's, that's why things are done in German in the first okay. place. Sure, sure. Um, and I, I can vouch for that. Having so the over. translation would actually need to be a, a very um, specific task because for the translator, because if, if, if German's more specific, trying to get into the English translation to be as accurate as possible to the original, mm. uh, that's quite a task on its own. So, it yes. It certainly is, and that's why all these, tasks, uh, all, all these uh, texts um, from Figu, uh, the official ones always must contain the original German, so at least the reader has a chance if they really want to get to the bottom of something to try and penetrate the German. Uh, yeah. that's, they can look at it themselves. It's, it's not 
an impossible task mm -hmm. to, to start to get to the bottom of the actual German language. It's, it is related to the English, mm -hmm. or vice versa, really. Um, right. Yes, so um, where would you like me to go from here? Well, we've got about uh, six minutes before the ad break, so what can you fit in six minutes? Oh, well. And then we can go into a new, a new angle or continue on after the break. Okay. Okay, so people... Um, as I've mentioned, we, we, we have a situation where we can't say, well, here's the text and, and you know, scientific tests have been done on it and they, they show that it's this, this old and was found in this location. Mm -hmm. We can't do that. And it's regrettable, of course, to, to a certain extent, because it is desirable that uh, from this, from these people, from Billy, from the Pliari, um, it is desirable that people know that the uh, text that people accept as the truth is actually a falsification of what was the truth. Um, they want that to be known because it, it has had a profound effect on this planet. Mm. But um, the other, the, really the very biggest uh, point that, that they want to convey to us in all of this teaching is we have lost the ability to think for ourselves. We have lost the uh, the habit of scrutinising things using our logic and reason <clears throat> and too quickly just fall to belief. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a result of this, uh, these falsifications uh, that because of this, they even though they have provided an enormous, an enormous body of evidence for their existence and for their sincerity and so forth, um, they also make it a real point of making sure we are left to think for ourselves in the end. And really, the way this has turned out is a perfect example uh, where you can't nail it down completely. Mm -hmm. You can't say, I'm 100% sure that this is now the genuine text. You can talk about likelihoods. You can talk about, well, these people seem to be genuine about everything else. You can talk about the likelihood of, <clears throat> in our past history, these uh, super long-lived, uh, you know, people with great powers or perhaps just very advanced human beings from other planets. You, you can talk about all sorts of things like the tendency of um, the history to be twisted by those in power. <laughs> you, know, you, <laughs> you can use reason on a whole lot of levels to reach sort of a, a, a probable likelihood of, of what the truth is. They don't want you to believe it. Mm. They don't want anyone to accept it as a, as a matter of belief. That would be totally counterproductive um, and uh, so again you, you fall back on scrutinizing the Billy Meyer case and you find that sure enough the stuff that is said by Emmanuel in the Talmud Emmanuel is the same thing that Billy Meyer is teaching and the Pliaran are saying it's the same message they say it's been told to us throughout the ages uh, by a lineage of prophets for uh, you know um, 11,500 years or so, uh, we've been getting uh, prophets coming and they always taught the same thing, but it has been twisted and contorted and pushed into uh, restrictive uh, religious contexts which have not uh, resulted in, in the full teaching being known. So, but they say it's always been, it's a teaching of the prophets, it's a teaching of the truth, the teaching of life, uh, the spiritual teaching. It's always been the same and uh never changes and i suppose the crux of it is about the teachings of uh, creation itself about the true spiritual aspect of creation yes yes so that's what they're saying it all leads back to the principles that underlie all reality it's a u universal teaching everyone would discover it eventually if only they paid attention um it's just that obviously it's helpful to have teachers who've learnt more than we have especially mm. if we're in a stage of confusion um due to you know, historic factors. Wow. Uh, so, yes, but it's the universal teaching of life. It's just the truth. It, they don't own it. They're just trying to pass it on to us so that we can wake up and start to discover it for ourselves mm -hmm. um, and not, not have it obscured by um, suffocating belief systems. Of course, I'm very, very aware that this is going to sound very uh, at odds with the truth for many, many people and downright offensive to many, many people. But all I'm doing is trying to explain what I think to be true. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, people have to think it out for themselves and see whether it really is. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
So what, what's the biggest difference between the current belief systems of, let's say, Christianity and what the Talmud teaches? So you would say that the Talmud is... Um, would be classified as like a gospel. How would you how would you describe it? The, Tal- the Talmud is just a book of learning. Mm-hmm. I think the word Talmud, and I, don't quote me on this, it means something like you know book of learning, book, book of teaching. Right, it's, right. That's what the word Talmud means. So it's it, it is just the account of the life and teaching of Emmanuel. Um, the the main difference, and I probably can't do much before your break on that, mm-hmm. is, is everything that's we know in the New Testament that's to do with salvation, having to be saved from our sins. Mm-hmm. Um, none of that's in this Talmud. Um, and everything that is dependent on, on the uh, grace of a God is not in this Talmud. Anything that puts uh, a teacher up on a pedestal for worship is not in this Talmud. Um, it's all to do with understanding the power of your own consciousness, uh, the healings a result of the power of the consciousness of those who were healed. Um, it's not through the faith in God. It's nothing to do with belief. It's to do with knowledge. So probably the simplest way to put it is cross out belief and replace that with knowledge. Right. Knowledge, knowledge of the power of the spirit or rather the power of the consciousness, which is the the tool that actually does the interacting and the, you know, um, applying these things in the real in the world. Excellent. Um, so that there are quite a, quite significant differences and yet much of the storyline has a superficial similarity to what Christians are quite accustomed to. And I, I was raised a Christian, by the way, so I do mm-hmm. have some understanding of how this is going to seem. I've been there. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, it's quite challenging, isn't it, when it, you've been raised a certain way and then it sort of totally changes your outlook. But in a, in a positive direction, in my point of view, um, well, it allows me. for more self-empowerment rather than the opposite of what some people may think. Yes. That's my experience. It's not only self-empowering, but if you really are empowering yourself in a way that is logical and truly empowering, you are also doing the greatest thing for your fellow human beings as well. So people hear that, oh, self-empowerment, and people sort of tend to think, oh, that's selfish. No, no. Um, And the self-empowerment assists other people as well. I mean, if you can empower others. Exactly. To do the same, then it's uh, well. One of the teachings I know in the original, um, like the not original, sorry, in the Christian doctrine is you know uh, love thy neighbour, and you know sometimes people take that out of context and just mean you know accept someone. But um, I believe that's in the Talmud as well, which is more or less along the lines of um, uh, loving someone else as yourself, so that um, there's a lot of love, wisdom, and joy in the Talmud, from what I understand. It's Love, love, harmony, uh, peace, freedom, knowledge. Um, it, it's 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 about harmony. It's about wow. it's about not going off to war. It's about mm-hmm. um, doing good, yes, to your fellow human being. It, it contains teaching love your enemy. Although even that has a difference. Welcome back to Expanding Into Consciousness. I'm your host, Rodrigo Soto, and you've joined us today listening to Vivian Lego Figure Australia to talk about the Talmud of Emmanuel and the Billy Meyer case. Um, thank uh, Vivian for um, being on the show with us. Um, before the break, we were discussing about um, the teachings of uh, Emmanuel, or um, specifically Emmanuel, but this is also the teachings that Billy Meyer is also uh, promoting, yes? Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, and in fact, I should mention that the uh, the text that um, uh, Judas Iscariot um, wrote was not the entirety of Emmanuel's teaching, according to this source. Um, okay. It he didn't have the capacity, it is explained in this book, uh, to comprehend all of. Emmanuel's teaching is just too comprehensive. So oh. he, he sort of did bits and pieces as well as bits of the story, and some of it was dictated by Emmanuel to him. Uh-huh. Um, as I said, there's a whole story around that, but but even this Talmud Emmanuel translation it doesn't contain anywhere near as much as <coughs> apparently ta- um, Emmanuel did teach. Right. 
So it does does the um is there a lot more that we um should know or that we can know from uh let's say studying the Billy Meyer material um wow. in comparison to the Talmud as well, or is it like yeah. a hand in hand? Oh, um, t- to me, it's it's much simpler to just head straight for Billy stuff. If 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 you find that it's trustworthy, if you find that mm-hmm. it, um, he seems to be who who he claims to be, and so on, then I would go straight to Billy's texts. Um, he, I mean, there is there is a still a PDF around that you can read of what's called the Goblet of the Truth, Goblet of the yeah. Truth, yeah. which is basically the, the teaching of the prophets, um, yeah. prepared in the modern time by Billy and his bit is is on the end of it he's he's added his bit to the end of it and um you know to my mind it, it's enormously comprehensive there are other big texts not all of which are, are translated yet but that one is yeah um and yes it, it's enormously thorough and goes a lot further uh about the teaching to do with the consciousness, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, but but there's a massive stack of books, most of which haven't been translated into English. Um, we just have a couple on our website available. And then the Canadian group's done a couple. In fact, it's the Canadian figure group that will be producing the English uh, translation of the Talmud oh, Manual. Excellent. Yeah. And the Goblet of the Truth is also um, a free uh, e-book that one I believe. well it's 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 a pdf i think that's PDF, still being yeah. made available as a pdf but but you can also get a hard copy mm-hmm. um and these books all have the german in them by requirement mm-hmm. so that people can scrutinize make sure that you know if there's any shortcomings in the in the english translation uh so that's always something to look out for if someone's trying to get to this information do try to seek the original materials that could still contain the german even if you can't read german uh, the chances that the English translation has has um, shifted away from the German are less if you've still got the German right there. Mm-hmm. Um, there's always going to be a problem with uh, translation sort of getting looser and looser as they get further and further removed from the original texts. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, so um, I want to bring up uh, Judas Iscariot and Judah E. Harriet. Mm. Okay. So that, that's, a, that's a pivotal part of the story because it is very different to mainstream uh, indoctrination, I suppose, what okay. we come to understand of that, these two characters or single character in the mainstream. All right. So so according to this, it, now, the name that is written in this German book is supposed to be his actual name. It's Judas Ischkeriot or Ischkeriot. I think that's mm-hmm. how you'd say it. I mean, I, I assume that's the spelling of the actual name and not a German, German, Germanification of it. Mm-hmm. Um Ishkeriot. The main thing you can notice is, is whether it's Ishariot or Ishkeriot. You have a K in the, the, the disciple, the one, only one who could write was Judas Ishkeriot. He apparently was not the betrayer. Um, there was a Pharisee. Now, the Pharisee, the Pharisees were uh, a Jewish sect who were, uh, particularly active this this particular group of pharisees was active in a resistance movement against the occupying romans and judas ishkeriot and emmanuel knew that so that was provided as a reason for why they wanted them gone they wanted them discredited they wanted emmanuel dead as well as the fact that emmanuel was teaching uh things that you know they were not doing they were carrying out violent acts and so forth or something to that effect and he was teaching peace harmony love and so forth um so they they didn't like what he was saying but this was a a political reason why they wanted him gone so this there was a um a family called ishariot without the k and there was a judas ishariot who sort of worked his way into the group of followers around emmanuel and uh caused some trouble um, so he was basically pretending to be a follower. Mm-hmm. Wasn't and, he um, a Pharisee's son? That's right. He was the son yep. of the Pharisee Simeon. I think it is Simeon. Simeon the Pharisee, yeah. Ishariot. So Simeon was, was you know, active in this, this small group of Pharisees that were agitating against the uh, Roman occupation. Uh-huh. And uh, his son was Judas. And this Judas is the one that finally betrayed Emmanuel. Um but a lot happened before this. Judas Iscariot, the, 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 um, the disciple of Emmanuel, the only one who could write, he wasn't entirely clean in the sense that he himself has written in the text 
of his wrong. He has written how, after writing the account, his account of Emmanuel's teaching and life, he actually had it stolen by Judas Ishiriot. Mm-hmm. Um, and this followed an incident where Judas Is- Iscariot had been collecting money uh, from people who had come to listen to Emmanuel mm-hmm. and keeping it for himself. And Judas Ishariot found out about that and went to tell Emmanuel, hoping for money in reward and didn't get any. And uh, somehow, as a result of that, after that, the text was stolen. So as a result of that, Judas Iscariot had to rewrite the entire text after being mm. taken off to the desert by Emmanuel for good teaching. <laughs> mm-hmm. Had to mm-hmm. be taught what was wrong with what he had done. And he'd had so does a... that mean that there's a second copy, the original? Well... The original was apparently destroyed. Uh, okay. Judas Ishariot took it back, and the, and the high priests destroyed it. Okay. So, so we have the the Pharisees, Sadducees, the high priests, and high council sort of all in cahoots in trying to uh, discredit and kill Emmanuel, fight charges against him because he was very obviously uh, preaching against their teaching um, and portraying them as misleaders. Uh, people who set themselves up as prophets. You know, Emmanuel refers repeatedly to um, the prophets, the prophets, the teaching of the prophets. Um, mm-hmm. uh, Emmanuel's own family, his his adopted father, uh, Joseph and Mary, were from a family that had certainly in more recent generations followed the teaching of the prophets, which is the teaching of the laws of creation. Um, so there's this idea presented that there have always been these teaching of the prophets that some people have still somehow managed to continue to follow while others have gone to the god belief right Um, so it wasn't just a small group that believed in the creation it was actually quite prevalent but in a sort of i'm still not clear on that but right more present than i would have imagined by the sounds of things yes yes that's what it sounds um like. that there were people here and there who who were still following the teaching of the prophets somehow it had been maintained in certain circles mm-hmm. and so they were able to you know emmanuel was able to 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 address the scribes and pharisees and say you scribes and pharisees you you sit on the chair of the prophets and you twist the truth and you keep people from the truth blah 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 as if uh-huh. as if this is just known the teaching of the prophets you know yeah yeah um so that's that's the basis of that uh so uh the first text that judas iscariot wrote was was stolen and destroyed Mm-hmm. And he had to start again. And the second text never was spread. But the second text, uh, after Emmanuel didn't die on the on the pole that yep. he was, to which he was nailed, um, he recovered and went off to the east. He went off to India and spent a long, long life teaching there and wound up in Kashmir. Yeah, according with his to the story. Uh, sons or son. Well, I think he, I think he had quite a lot of children. He uh-huh. had he had a wife, and, and they had many children. Well, quite a few children, and one son I think uh, returned after he died at the age of 111 or something. Yeah. Um, and put that text back into the burial hole. Right. Uh, to keep it safe, I suppose. Mm-hmm. But it mm-hmm. was never spread. So what was spread was the recollections of mm-hmm. the teaching of the account that was written by Judas Iscariot by the other disciples. Mm-hmm. So they, obviously, a lot of them were there. They weren't always there with, with Emmanuel, sort of the way it is portrayed in the New Testament. They were, some couple would go with him here and a couple would go with him there, and sometimes they were all together. But they had jobs, you know, mm-hmm. they had, yeah, they had like lives. They, they actually didn't just abandon their families and livelihoods livelihood. mm-hmm. and, and just follow him. Um, they actually had to maintain their lives as well in a responsible manner. That's part of the teaching. And uh, so um, we don't have this kind of just impractical seeming abandonment of Mm -hmm. of your life. Um, And so the disciples, it is explained, it's not through any ill will, but just through having profound misunderstandings and only having a verbal recollection Mm -hmm. of the teaching they went about teaching and getting bits wrong. Uh, mm-hmm. For instance, there was a prevalent idea that uh, Emmanuel was the son of God. Mm-hmm. Because, you see, the Jewish people were expecting a Messiah. Yeah. 
um, and this Messiah was going to save them on behalf of Yahweh, their God. Um, and so this is what Emmanuel was trying, it was presented as being in, in those circles. And he kept saying, I'm not the son of God. I'm the son mm. of a, um, an overseeing emissary of, of the Ishwish, who is a king mm-hmm. of wisdom and is not God and, and there is no God. And, um, but his a disciples. Celestial brother, from what I remember, it was written. Well, as... celestial sons or something is, is the way they refer to in, in some places. And I'm a little confused at this point, but right. the, the travelers from afar, from mm-hmm. the depths of space, you know, is, is who this extraterrestrial was referred to. They had a leader. They had a leader who was called an Ishwish which is okay. one of those words with way too many consonants in it for my mind. Uh-huh. Um, but it is shortened to J-H-W-H. Ah. And those, the letters... Which others say Jehovah. Others say... Right. Exactly. So, like so okay. an Ishwish is supposed to refer to someone who has an extremely high level of knowledge, wisdom in the creational laws. Um, so sort of the highest just about the highest possible level of knowledge, wisdom, and love in relation to the creational laws. Um, it's not and just knowing about the laws, though. It's also about applying exactly. the, the knowledge, and that becomes wisdom, doesn't it? Yes. Yes, yes. Okay. that that's, cool. sounds like a good explanation. And so apparently the story is that there always were Ishwishes, and this is something that extends way back to other planets and other times. It's an mm-hmm. ancient, ancient thing that's inconceivably old. Um but various people came to Earth. Some were really Ishwishes and had some involvement. Others just pretended to be and weren't mm-hmm. and called themselves Ishwish when they had no right. And, right. and these characters had absolutely no um, divine power. They were not God creators. You know, mm-hmm. they're not creator gods, I should say. Um, the whole idea of a creator god was something they say was an invention to uh, by various um, extraterrestrial uh, people who came to Earth and, and basically wanted to control the Earth human beings. Right. So you're saying that Ishwishes or the Ishwish had the power of manifestation or the, the ability for manifestation? Well, I mean, what does, what does that mean? Well, the, the, the power of intent and the power of, um, or not power, I suppose that, that sounds a little bit selfish, but the ability to uh, create, not something out of thin air, but the intent to um, have something occur in the reality because of their understanding of the laws of creation? Well, um, in theory, we all do. Uh, yes. It's just that it, as your consciousness grows and develops and becomes greater, your capacity to do that is much greater. Much greater, right. And the issues were, at, I suppose, would be the label or the top of the ranks who, who were able to do that. I guess so. But they said, right. I mean, there's no talk about them sort of creating wonders or anything. Sure. So, so, that's so, what I said about the intent or the manifestation rather than creating something out of thin air. They would understand they would they would understand that the, the principles behind the power of the consciousness, the power of thought, um, and probably were capable of doing things that would seem to be miracles. Right. Um, but uh, the whole matter is confused when it comes to the gods of the earth who were uh, seemingly into deceit of various kinds and could have used technology also. Sure. Um, and, uh, yeah, so so we had these figures called Ishwishes, and mm-hmm. obviously the title got into the, uh, the the Hebrew god, was referred to as J-H-W-H, the, uh, he couldn't be named, and yet we have the names Yahweh, uh, Jehovah, that come mm-hmm. from those letters. Yeah. Um, but, but it does originally, they say, refer to this word Ishwish, um, king of wisdom is, is really what it's called. And this, right. this figure, so uh, perhaps a way of clarifying the difference between the New Testament and um, what's in this text is, is by mentioning some of the things that the translator didn't translate appropriately. Uh-huh. Uh, one is he didn't write Ishwish. Ishwish was in the text. He saw that and just said, oh, God. Uh, Not through any ill intent, but just because that's what he knew he wish to mean. That means, was yeah. God's name, you know. Um, so he just wrote God. And although in those earlier versions of the Talmud, this God character is obviously not behaving as an authority who's punishing or anything like that, he's behaving more like an Ishwish, that's still a very misleading thing because these, you know, in this text, Emmanuel is saying God is an invention. God is a delusional invention that you've constructed. He doesn't exist, which has really made them angry. Uh, yeah. really made them want to kill him. 
Um, and saying, no, there's no God, you know, a human being cannot be on the, on a par with creation. Um, he's not on a pedestal. Uh, this cannot be. Um, but there is an ishwish and I am, I'm, I'm not God's son because there is no God. And, you know, I'm, I'm the, the son of an ishwish. Um, no, I'm the son of the helper of an ishwish. That's hard. Okay, apologies. Gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. Well, see, so, so even then I got it right. And if I wrote it down, it would have been passed down as being facts, which is sort of how it occurred with the Talmud, right? So, right. Right, and, so, saying, and the incorrect translation. Right, and so we, so I was coming from telling you how so so the poor, you know, I say poor, I shouldn't, <laughs> I shouldn't um, indulge in pity for these people because of my tax responsibility. But the, the sure. situation was the disciples at the time were hearing everyone saying, "Oh, he's the son of God, the son of God, the son of God." And of course, they didn't have, they couldn't write, they couldn't read, wow. and so some of them they just thought, "Oh well, I guess he is the son of God." And he went around telling everybody. Oh, wow. And so some of those things crept in, apparently, uh, according to this story, that way. Um, so apparently after Emmanuel left um, that area, after the after he was nailed to the Y-shaped pole, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. on his way to India, he dictated parts of the story to another person who was not one of his followers another because there were only a few people around who could write so um you know people relied on these few who could write to wow. actually write things down so you mm-hmm. get people who would write on behalf of various of the disciples but each one who wrote also put their own slant on the thing yeah and this sort of thing but uh, the, the where there are great similarities in the new the new testament the book of matthew basically and um and this text the talmud emmanuel it is explained that that's because there were certain parts that emmanuel simply dictated to another writer whose work eventually got incorporated into the book of matthew and he also obviously dictated bits to um judas iscariot who created this text um and you certainly find if you study um, pr- the information that's being presented now as the, the age-old teaching of the prophets, <clears throat> they come up with word-for-word explanations about various things um, mm. that you think, wait a minute, why are they using exactly the same words that I've heard Emmanuel say? And their explanation is, well, they were the best words. Mm-hmm. They still are the best words. Yep. So they used the same words through their eons because after you get you get to a point where there is a very best way to put things Right. And so you use it, mm-hmm. and they don't say, "Well, I don't want to, I don't want to worry about, you know, copyright and things like that." Mm-hmm. There was no no issue. They just don't see it that way. Right, right. So, um, so the best way of putting it was just the way it came out. So it there, just there was logic on. behind the choices of the words, and so the logic is always there. Right, right. It comes out the same way each time. Um, other mm-hmm. things, of course, he would have used more common speech and, and explaining different ways depending on the circumstances, but, but classic bodies of teaching were pretty well set. And um, I guess that's why you do see quite similar bits mm-hmm. between these two texts. You know, it is in a way comforting to see a very similar story. You still get, you still get, um, you know, the young woman, Mary, not, not a virgin, and this is something that the translator didn't convey. He put virgin, but it was a young woman, Mary. Mm-hmm. So all, all these things about all these things that uh, have been miracleized. Um, mm. There was there was a desire to uh, take the things that happened around Emmanuel, and there really were people getting healed, mm-hmm. um, to take things of that kind and to sort of turn them into miracles to prove his divine provenance, to to to, to prove his divine connection with God. Mm-hmm. Um, because people people wanted to to think that he was God's son and he was going to save them. Mm-hmm. Um, but so the explanation is that a lot of this was exaggerated. There were there were not five. There was not the feeding of the five thousand. In that regard, it's quite disappointing if you're raised on these ideas. You think, oh, only power of the mind, and you can feed five thousand people. <laughs> but he said, well, no, he didn't do that. Actually, in the end, there was only fifty. Mm. Um, but stories got exaggerated in order because it was so. That's how you spread stuff in those days. You made a really good story, 
Mm -hmm. Um, So people from various camps, by the sounds of it, spread the stories, uh, the teaching that that he was providing, or spread the falsified teaching. Right, right. With the great stories. Well, it works that way these days. You get a good book, you can see a good movie. Uh, As long as it's got a good plot line, you go see it, right? Right. So it doesn't seem to change just because of the era. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so I said that. But um, we're just coming up to the second break. Um, got a couple of minutes, but uh, I suppose people are itching to know. We're talking about the book, but I suppose I want to know is what are the teachings or just the basic teachings of creation or what does it aspire to? So if we can discuss that after the break, that would be good. Okay. Um, and just uh, we could just touch base on it for about half an hour. Um, sure. That would be good. So we've got a couple of minutes before the ad break, and then after that we're going to have Jolly's Astrology. Uh, is there anything you want to touch on before we head into the break? Oh, that's, that's hard. It's too big, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> it's just a uh, welcome back to Expanding Into Consciousness. I'm your host, Rodrigo Soto, and uh, on today's show, we have Vivian Leg of Figu Australia to talk about the Talmud of Emmanuel and Billy Meyer. So before we went to the break, um, we were talking about the Talmud of Emmanuel, Judah, Ishkariot, and the uh, Ishwish. Uh, but uh, what we haven't really discussed too much about is actually what is what are the teachings of Emmanuel or were the teachings of Emmanuel and what are the teachings of Billy Meyer? So, uh, Vivian, would you like to start off on about just some, some I suppose, what what are creational laws or um, and where and we can head off from there? Okay, I'll, I'll do my best. Maybe the mm-hmm. way maybe the way to um, introduce this whole area is to think about since we're talking about the Talmud, think mm-hmm. about the healing. Um, now, apparently what happened a lot of the time is Emmanuel just had a good knowledge of herbs and salves. So okay. he, actually, he was actually able to do fairly conventional healing that just wasn't known to a lot of the people around him. Uh-huh. He had friends in the East. They, they were actually responsible for giving him, uh, for helping him recover from his ordeal on the nail to the, to the pole. Uh-huh. Um, but also what happened is people had heard about him. They came up to him. They said, you know, Master, Master, if I just touch your garment, I will be healed of this hemophilia, although they didn't call it that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and he would say something like, well, if that's what you think, then so it will be. And then he would explain to them that it was the power of their consciousness that did that. Um, he also had incidences where someone had heard of him and thought he was the son of God and thought they would be saved through God's mercy, basically, by touching him. And he would say, well, who do you think is going to do that? And that, they would say, oh, God, or something. And he would say, well, it was, well, let's see that, let it be so then. And they wouldn't be healed, and it would be concluded that they didn't really believe. Mm-hmm. So the teaching there was very clearly... Um, you can do it with your own consciousness. That's what it is. So when somebody else appears to be healing someone, it's not so much that they are healing, but they are triggering a healing in somebody. So right. you, one's own consciousness is actually activating the healing. Um, mm-hmm. So if, if, if you are healed in the presence of someone who is a healer, it's because you're allowing that that um, their intent to trigger your own consciousness decision. Um, that's the teaching. The more of an instrument or a, a tool rather than um, the actual healer itself that's providing the healing. You're, you're, yes. you're activating your own healing capacity. Because you're letting it. Um, mm-hmm. But you don't need another person to do that. It's just that people have a belief and an expectation. Mm-hmm. And, and one of the things that uh, Emmanuel and and this current teaching is trying to stress is that it's better to learn to do it yourself mm-hmm. um, because if you're constantly looking externally for your salvation, your healing, you will not discover the strength that you have right. um, to do these things yourself. Um, so it's the power of the consciousness, and he would talk suggestively to people. So someone who was sick would come up and say, look, I'm, I'm in a terrible state because I have leprosy and I just I can't handle it. And really they were referring to their mental state a lot of the mm-hmm. time. And he would talk suggestively to them and it address their consciousnesses deeply. So in other words, a sort of expert hypnosis sort of thing. Like an NLP sort of thing. I don't know. What's that? Uh, neuro-linguistic program. Oh, I don't know. I'm just going to use simple language. Sure, hypnosis Sorry. Well. Yeah. I don't know yeah, what yeah. I'm talking about otherwise. Um, but suggestive, just, just mm-hmm. expert suggestion where he would get their consciousnesses to reach that point of accepting 
the possibility that they can do it, you know, that, that this will be. Um, but he would teach them that that's what was happening. Um, and it wasn't the power of, of a god or something that, that had done this. Um, and so the teaching throughout the Talmud and also the teaching that Billy provides is a teaching where you, it's a matter of respecting the truth of the creational laws. What are the creational laws? They're the principles that govern all of reality uh, and can be discovered by any peoples anywhere given enough time and attentiveness. So it's things like learning the power of the consciousness. It's the cause and effect principle. It's understanding that we have a negative and positive in, in all things. Um, these principles, you know, um, can be demonstrated to the individual. They just are. There are things that if you, you can decide that they don't apply to you, but you will still um, suffer the consequences if you do certain things. You will still, um, even if you don't think that your thoughts have any power and are forming your life, it doesn't mean they're not. Mm -hmm. It just means you think they're not. Yeah. Um, that's that's basically it. So the laws, so-called laws, are that you have this power of consciousness, um, and the so-called recommendations are therefore it's best to pay attention to what you're thinking and to direct them in the best possible harmonious way. Mm -hmm. um, but you can ignore you can ignore the directive, but it's it's going to mean that your life will be hard. Um, but there is no punishment from a god because there is no god. It's it's you're you're in this cycle of evolution, where you're constantly gaining love, knowledge, and wisdom. And mistakes, mistakes are just the natural part of that process and are not to be condemned. And so the whole idea of being saved from our sins was something you know. It's it's the focus. It's it's you know, Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sins. Well, the name Jesus itself means Yahweh saves. I think that's it. And so, so they say he was not called Jesus because that name itself implies the need for salvation. Uh -huh. And they say, well, no, if some other being could even save you, then it actually wouldn't do you any good because that would take away your necessary learning because mistakes are for learning from. Uh -huh. So if you have done made a mistake and done someone or yourself some harm, then the only way forward is to examine that error and see what it is, try to understand what's happened and then rectify it. You can't do that if you just simply hand it over to a higher being. Um, you never do it if you do that, at which point you, um, you are going to stagnate. Yeah. And, and not progress. And so the whole idea of salvation is is counter to, to this particular... To the teaching. So it takes away from the power of the individual. And yes, and, and doesn't allow that, that healthy process of evolution. Wow. Um, and it sort of leaves you a victim of this. It, it leaves you fearful that if you don't have your sins forgiven, then you're going to, you know, rot in hell or whatever the, mm -hmm. the latest version is. Um mm -hmm. But the whole idea of original sin is, is nothing to do with this teaching. Mm -hmm. That, that, that Bap, John the Baptist is not John the Baptist. John is an, an initiator into the teaching of the prophets. So he went through a little ceremony sort of thing mm -hmm. um, where he was simply introducing people who wanted to know into the teaching of the prophets through a little ceremony or something. Mm -hmm. um, he was not baptizing, they say, because the whole notion of baptism assumes that you're a sinner that needs God's grace. Uh -huh. That we don't have original sin. Um, we're just born innocent. We are born afresh, without the baggage of previous lives, um, without, you know, just and and the things, the errors that the wrong paths that we take are as a result of decisions we make during our lives. We're not born with, with evil in us. Um, so that it's completely free of anything that's to do with salvation and needing to be saved. Um, but on the other hand, the power comes from learning to recognize your own creational powers within you, uh, pay attention to the creational laws, um, you know, cause and effect, um, and recognizing that you steer your own life through your decisions and obviously working at harmony and so forth. One thing I haven't mentioned yet is the, um, 
the translator left out the mention of the 17 female disciples. Mm. Now, I don't think that's wrong, but it's one of those things that I think, what? <laughs> you know, it's hard. It's so different. It's so different from what we've been raised on. But yeah. apparently there were 17 disciples, including Mary and um, Emmanuel's mother, and they themselves taught. Um, in part of the Talmud here, you know, and Mary taught about this and Esther taught about that. And they would come out when, you know, Emmanuel had done his bit and gone away, but the people were still there. They'd, they'd come out and they'd do a bit of teaching. Uh -huh. um, so there were 17 female disciples, but according to the story, um, they, they, they caused bits of writing to be written and wrote letters and things like that. Um, but all the things that they produced were destroyed right. because it was a man's world and this couldn't be. Uh -huh. It was a patriarchal system. Yes, and so and, one of the, and Emmanuel was trying to bring a you know the balance back. Exactly, and in fact, um, one of the great tirades he does against the scribes and Pharisees is is, or is it more specifically the Pharisees? He he criticised them um, very stridently for their treatment of women, uh -huh. um, and for the fact that they weren't allowed to be part take any any official roles in the church uh -huh. in in their religious ceremonies uh -huh. and and the way they were treated in general so he has quite a broadside against them in that regard and yeah. um, that was completely left out by the translator uh -huh. uh, it just didn't sit with the greek orthodox view of things uh -huh. um and of course all this made the scribes pharisees high priests and so forth extremely angry and you can understand why there was such ill feeling and why there still is mm -hmm. uh, against this text and this material. Um, so what else of the teaching? Um, so we have the healing. Well, before you go on, um, I think Scarlett had a question. Scarlett, you I, Yeah, I'm here. I actually did. It goes back um, a couple of minutes to when you were discussing um, – sort of like the power within and the no original sin. And that if you make a mistake, uh, it's more of something that you need to um, take personal responsibility for, examine and grow from that. Mm -hmm. uh, that is actually something that without knowing any of this beforehand, although I am very familiar with, with uh, Billy Meyer and his work, um, as far as the, the UFOs and the extraterrestrial contact is concerned. Um, my Over the past year, um, I guess I had gone through what would be considered a firewalk more uh, by the indigenous peoples. And one of the things that really came to the forefront for me about a year ago at this point was taking very personal responsibility for the choices that I've made. And the realization, uh, uh, the grave, dismal at the time realization that all of my choices, uh, no matter what the intention behind them at the time, led me to the point I was at to face these sort of consequences, I guess you could say. And I just love, love, love that that is a part of what this Talmud is teaching that personal responsibility is paramount. You cannot grow. You cannot evolve. You cannot expand if you're not taking ownership of the choices that, you, that you've made. Yes, yes, I find it a wonderful thing. It's, it's liberating. I mean, at first, at first it can sound like some, you know, terrible burden of responsibility, but what they mean is, You've got the controls. Mm -hmm. you, you didn't realize yeah. it, but you've got the controls within you. Once you recognize this, you can start to control it in a way that's good for you, not bad for you. Right. And so it's enormously right. liberating. And, you know, you recognize this in another context, and that's the point of this teaching. It's not, oh, these are the teaching from these people. It's this is what's true. We've described it well because, we, you know, we've been around a long time, we know. Uh-huh. But it's just the universal law. It's just what you would discover. It's it's like, for instance, they explain that um, people who are the so-called more primitive races uh, living more um, close to nature on this planet are much more likely to be in tune with the laws of creation 
because they're paying attention. They haven't been distracted by a lot of the things that we come with what we call civilization. Mm, mm. Um, it's just what you learn when you are in touch with nature. Yes, the indigenous so, of Australia are, are well known for that. Yeah, you know, they, they, they live with nature. They know how nature works, and they talk about the very similar. I mean, from their perspective, of course, but very similar concepts in regards to that. They're in, that the laws of creation are basically what what is a universal law. Um, so yes, indigenous of Australia are very paramount, and actually in the indigenous cultures of um, most uh, other cultures as well, not just Australia. Mm. Um, yes, that that's actually what I was going to say. The indigenous peoples of um, the Americas, mm -hmm. we'll put it that way, um, at, you know, North America, South America, um, everything from the quote-unquote Indians to the Mayans to, you know, so on and so forth. I mean, their their original teachings or belief systems were so extremely different, and that's why Christianity felt they had to come through and put boots to throat in order to get conversions and the entire um, Christian religion or most um, formal indoctrinated, I, sh I should say politely, uh, religions are very much fear-based. And mm. fear is the ultimate control mechanism. And when you're afraid, you function from an entirely different space and it takes you completely out of spirit and directly into uh, mind, even reptilian mind, if you wanted to take it to that extreme. And it's, I think, being free of that, or, or at the very least, being aware of that as a reality helps you to see things in a different way. So, and like yourself, Vivian, I was raised very much so within the, uh, what they refer to as the traditional Christian church. And there was a lot of, indoctrination that happened and it was it was a it was a traumatic experience leaving the church and leaving behind those mindsets and even to this day some 20 years later I'll have little triggers that'll say oh but wait what if oh but wait what if these teachings were correct and now you're going to burn in hell for all eternity mm. and, and they don't last long anymore but I mean they could send me spiraling for days at a time yeah. before reaching this point it's like I, a programming isn't it yes, yes. And, and I find that anything that comes with fear attached to it uh, doesn't lead to truth because I don't think truth brings fear I mean, truth right. is liberating I, I agree I agree yeah, so it's... there's nothing nothing in the Talmud or anything that Billy teaches brings any fear yeah and um, to me uh, that 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 sense, you know, it seems logical because, I mean, the, the one thing I didn't love about Christianity was that I forced myself to believe in Christianity was because I was scared of going to hell, not because of the the goodness and salvation of Jesus, but because I was scared of going to hell. Mm -hmm. So that there was a fear aspect, and that to me now, realizing and looking back, that doesn't feel right, mm -hmm. you know. And so yeah, that's what I wanted to say about. Um, well, that that sort of goes to say about the the organizations of the religions in the world about, you know, what they know to be true and what they're, what they're purporting, you know, they, they want a control system. I mean, that's digressing a little bit, but um, that goes to show about the, the extent of how powerful this message is. Mm. And this is, this is why um, this is seen to be such a big deal. This is why it's so important that uh, people consider this with their reason and logic and not with their belief, because it's only by actually using your conscious consciousness and applying it with logic um you know logic in, and is not removed from love you know i um, mm -hmm. I, I, I i sort of grew up thinking that sort of love was on one side and logic and reason was on the other and if you applied too much logic and reason the love would disappear or something like that mm -hmm. but actually this of course brings all of those things together that yeah, you right. can't have one without the other um you, you can't have uh growth without truth um you know just Things like the cross, the cross, um, he was not, uh, Emmanuel was not um, nailed to a cross, that at the time they used Y-shaped uh, tree trunks, you know, tree, trees, yeah. trees that had Y-shaped y branches because it was very painful and, um, you know, they, they dealt with murderers and robbers and people this way. 
mm-hmm. and uh, they didn't use a cross. That was something that was introduced by Christianity later on because cross uh, has a symbol of... Uh, uni- symbolism, yeah. Well, uniting heaven and earth. You see, the whole thing was supposed to mean, um, you know, this sort of rising from the dead, uh, everlasting life, this sort of thing. In fact, they said, well, all it was was just a terrible death on a, on a pole. Mm-hmm. Um, that you don't want to overcome, you don't want to have eternal life. I mean, you want to evolve. Um, he teaches reincarnation in the Talmud. Uh, that's another thing they wouldn't have appreciated. No. You learn through reincarnation. You have multiple lives. So there's nothing to be gained by having an eternal life where you just stagnate. Mm-hmm. Um you know, there's nothing to be gained by, by, by being removed from that cycle of learning. So, um, and, and again, being saved by someone else. So the symbolism is radically different. You know, you don't have the cross. That, that They're quite strong on these points that, that you know, that he was called um, Jesus. They're very unhappy about and He was called Christ. This is, they take great exception to that because this means Yahweh saves and, you, and you're all sinners. <laughs> and they say, no, no. No, there was no original sin, you know. Um, So, uh, what else? Um, That goes to say that mainstream uh, indoctrination is kind of disempowering, you know. And then that takes away, because it's disempowering, that's taking away your power. Absolutely. And and therefore you become weak in consciousness. You get high, the whole thing gets hijacked. Your your development mm -hmm. gets hijacked and you live in fear. Um. And yes, indeed, other people report being fearful of starting to accept this teaching that, that Billy's now providing, um, j- just because it does trigger those, oh, but what if I what if go, go to hell? Yeah, exactly. You know, um, anyway, so there's none of that in the Talmud mm-hmm. Emmanuel, absolutely none of that. But it's not comfortable in the sense that it, it requires hard work, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, in order to get back a grip on your own development you've, you've got to do some very serious self-examination and self-work um, and not and get over this tendency to constantly reach for a higher being to do it for you um, and uh, it's very much a teaching of equality, equality between men and women, um, equality between all people that, that a, a great teacher such as Emmanuel and the Ishwish who was you know, overseeing this program, basically, with his uh-huh. helpers. Um, they're not to be put on a pedestal. They're just people. They're just human beings. Um, they just happen to be have developed a lot more in certain ways. Um, they got their knowledge through their own hard effort of evolution. Yeah, uh, it, didn't just land in the, it didn't just land in their laps. Mm. There's a logic behind everything. So, you know, you don't suddenly get someone who's full of wisdom. Mm-hmm. That person is wise because he's undergone many, many um, evolu- incarnations. You know, incarnations. Mm-hmm. Um, and the same applies to every human being. You don't, you don't suddenly evolve. You don't undergo a course of meditation and suddenly become enlightened. It's a, a progressive thing. You gradually, gradually grow. Um, you can't miss any steps in, in the learning. And so there's, you know, the teaching is in the teaching. The teaching is in the context of, uh, you know, the Pharisees coming up and saying, well, what's the greatest law? You know, trying to mm. trick Emmanuel in, so that they can get him for blasphemy. And yeah. uh, he's saying, well, you know, um, you know, God isn't, God isn't, uh, God doesn't exist. Um, uh, the Ishwish is not on the same level as the creation. Um you know, you should honour the the laws that the Ishwish has because he's a wise leader. But they describe the Ishwish as being a character who basically gives wise advice and can implement various things at the will of the people. So he's, you know, it's true democracy. All right, we'll be right back after the break. You've joined us on Expanding into Consciousness. We'll be right back to further discussion on the Talmud of Emmanuel. We're on our last leg, people, so be prepared. Please stay tuned. Welcome back to Expanding Into Consciousness. I'm your host, Rodrigo Soto, and on today's show we have Vivian Legg from Figu Australia talking about the Talmud of Emmanuel and Billy Meyer. So before the break, we were talking about the power of the consciousness and the laws of creation. Uh, we've got about 30 minutes left, so where would you like to head with this, Vivian? Oh, look, there's so many places I could potentially go. Um, I suppose we've covered the main main areas in the Talmud, but I could talk a little bit more about the logic. Um, yes. For instance, we have 
you know, it just isn't really there in, in the in the New Testament. But um, what Emmanuel teaches is find your answer in logic because these laws are based on logic. Um, love, you can't separate love and logic. And so, for instance, there's the, the Christian teaching is thou shalt not kill. Now, in fact, what is said in this is, uh, you know, don't do it wrongly. Don't don't do it um, without logic. And the logic is if someone's about to massacre your whole family, um, then it's not a good idea just to let them. Um, but the logic also says um, you, you try to prevent them non-lethally if you possibly can but if you can't there are certain circumstances where a life has to be taken because it was about to take your life and the life of mm-hmm. you know your whole family for instance so it's so hard to get your head around that if you've come from a christian belief but if you think of the logic you recognize that that is completely sound you know every life should be preserved if possible because even um, even someone who has done a horrible thing is denied the opportunity to actually learn um, in a way that has made that person not a threat to anyone um, if you kill that person you know so so the whole idea of of taking someone's life as punishment is absolutely um, opposed in this teaching mm-hmm. um, torture and all those things are absolutely opposed. Emmanuel criticises harshly the uh, the way the Pharisees treat people who disobey, um, you know, their laws and the God's law, that um, all these things like stoning and, all, and so forth, of course, and putting people to death is completely wrong. Um, and again, it comes back to the logic. How can that person learn um, the laws of nature if they have been killed? Um, and so, again, it's better putting them through. It's more about um, rehabilitation rather than punishment. So, and that's for the spirit rather than for the person as well. So, if someone commits some sort of crime, then it'd be best to put them in a situation where they law- learn the laws of the universe or right. uh, the laws of creation. Right. Okay. And that they make that brings me to um, you know you mentioned the spirit there. Uh, that brings me to the point about the spirit through this. Talmud Emmanuel, the word spirit is used to mean the power of the spirit for this and that and the other. But actually, it's also explained that Emmanuel used that word because people could not understand what was meant by the consciousness. Mm. So the way it's described in the, in the broader teaching is that um, spirit is, is the empowering energy um, that brings life to the human being and that takes up the purest knowledge, love and wisdom. Um, as the human being accumulates it, but it is the consciousness of the human being that actually does the work. It's the right. consciousness that is the interface and, and gathers that knowledge, love and wisdom. Um, so the spirit doesn't do those things. It's uh, It doesn't have that function according so to So the spirit teaching. is the life force then of the body? Pre- pretty much. That's right, yes. Right. Okay. Yes. So um, it's the consciousness that's so important. But when we talk about the consciousness, we're talking about something that is capable of healing. It's, it's capable of, of sending... Um, you know, it's expression of its thoughts across the world. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, capable of, you know, moving objects across the room. It's capable of all these amazing things. Um, so it's not the limited thing that we tend to think of. We tend to think of it just being a material thing. But, uh, you know, a lot, in a sense, a lot of these things are described as being material functions, like the, the telepathy, the first form of telepathy is apparently a, um, a material function. It's bizarre. Anyway, <laughs> the, so we have um, the spirit uh, is is the enlivening force, and of course, it enlivens the series of reincarnations. Um, what else can we talk about? We can talk about uh, the purpose of suffering. That um, you know, he, we still have the, the so-called Sermon on the Mount, where he's, he's saying, um, you know, be happy if you are suffering, because this is a great teacher. And you can be comforted. Um, it talks about the, the value of seeking. If you seek, if you hunger and thirst for the truth, you will find it. That you're not, and that's the thing. You see, if you have a belief system that simply says believe this, don't don't question it, and then everything will be fine, then you're not actually seeking knowledge. 
you're not actually seeking learning um, because you might learn something that contradicts this thing that you're supposed to believe. Um, and so to truly seek and find, that's, that's the evolutionary way. And that brings about the learning experiences. It brings about the knowledge. It's, it demonstrates the power of the consciousness, of your own consciousness. Um, so that's definitely a part of the whole thing. Um, I, you know, we have a situation where you, you, the whole walking on the water incident apparently was not actually uh, a walking on the water. Um, there was a storm. Emmanuel was in a shallow boat and like a rafty sort of thing. Um, a low boat and it appeared to the disciples who were some of the disciples who were off in a boat on the stormy water that he was just standing on the water but he wasn't he was on this very low boat and he was coming to them to try and calm them uh, I think that's the story and uh, the disciple Peter uh, gets very nervous and wants to come to Emmanuel across the water rather than stay in the boat where he's scared and Emmanuel basically says Stay there, you're fine. Just just have the knowledge that you're fine where you are. Just have the knowledge that you're fine. So basically, again, a teaching of the power of the consciousness. But but Peter doubted and was fearful, and so he attempted to get out of the boat and go to Emmanuel and fell and had to be pulled out of the water. And so it's a teaching of trusting your consciousness. And the, the word, the German word for trust, I think, is it is used here. Um you are still there, aren't you? Because I'm not hearing your voice. Yes, yes, I'm here. Okay. That's very important information. <laughs> okay, okay. I was just a bit concerned there. It was a bit quiet. Um, so, you know, there's all sorts of examples like that. Um, that seems to be the, the thrust of what he teaches in this text. It's the power of the consciousness. It's understanding the role of creation. Mm. Um, it's understanding your role and, and that even creation itself evolves creation itself is not perfect you know uh, this is in contrast to this idea that we're caused to believe that uh you know god is a creator god and god is perfect well he says well you know a human being can't be on a par with creation and even creation isn't perfect it evolves um mm. so again looking for the answers in nature uh, looking after your psychical health by creating harmonious thoughts and not being full of worry and grief and sorrow because that won't help. Um, obviously not going to war. Um, mm. And again, not belief, not belief, but knowledge. Have mm. the knowledge of wisdom, I think the phrase is. Um, so eventually, eventually your knowledge turns into wisdom. Um, so it's uh, anything that is not against the poverty of consciousness. So anything that is positive and the growth of consciousness is basically a universal law. Um, yes, yes. And everything that facilitates its its growth. Growth, yeah. That's right. Um, and anything that sort of denies you the right to think um, is not going to help. And that, that takes me back to this, the whole context that this story sits in which is considering whether you know billy Meyer really is talking to extraterrestrials consider whether he really could have this greater knowledge and people talk about the evidence you know the the hard evidence which in my view is extremely substantial it's more than enough to demonstrate you know um you, you have to use your reason and logic some some people think oh yes but Maybe these pliar are up to no good. I mean, they're telling us that in the, in the past, you know, these extraterrestrials have come and misled us and pretended to be gods and done this and mm. done that. So why why should we trust them? And there's quite a few people who tend to think that, you know, the pliar and, well, you know, why should we trust them? And in a way, that's good because they don't want us to fall on our faces and think, angels, God, <laughs> you know, they don't want us to be reliant on them in any way. Um, and you have to think it through and you have to think, well, let's see now. We know about secret military rogue projects that have extraordinary technologies and the capacity to deceive. Maybe it's them. <laughs> but but would they present us with a teaching that gave us power and made us good to each other and uh, would actually lead to a world where there was no overpopulation? Now, that's something that Emmanuel does teach. Uh -huh. He talks about how because of his teaching being pressed into a cult of belief where people are removed from reality people will lose their connection with 
nature lose their respect for nature and there will be this scourge of overpopulation which will be destroying the planet mm-hmm. um and uh so that's one of one of the things. I mean, would would ill-meaning people provide teaching that would cause us to do things that actually make life better for us? Um, my answer is a clear no. Um, would they keep pointing to things that were uncomfortable truths and made us feel at times frustrated with them? You know, it's not self. It, 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 they they are not afraid to make themselves look bad if it encourages the way we think. If it encourages mm-hmm. us to think, I should say, mm-hmm. um, and that's the point. We've got to think for ourselves, fall back on our own resources, and not just want someone bigger and better to think it out for us. Um, even though they provide this extraordinary assistance, ultimately it's in your own responsibility to uh, to reach conclusions that you can work with, um, wow. and that's that's the point. That really is the point, and then you can grow. So he had a very long life of teaching over in India and Kashmir, mm-hmm. and because uh, the God believers, the, he referred to the God believers um, as a part. He didn't say the Jews, the Jews. He said the God sure. believers. He was not uh, a one of them. Mm-hmm. Um, apparently, this I find this book fascinating because not only do we have the story of him going and being taken away for forty days and forty nights for an intensive training up in some spaceship high above the earth mm-hmm. by um on behalf of the ishwish who had various teachers um and emmanuel was taught he had to be taught also in this life in his lifetime um he went off and had this training and he was taken to india by his father gabriel when he was a teenager mm-hmm. uh for more learning there and um um i find it fascinating because it even traces his the lineage of uh, Joseph and Mary um, back to Adam. They've got the names stretching right back to Adam. So Adam is no longer this nebulous figure with a story about a, an <laughs> apple that never does really make sense. Um, Adam is a, a human being created, uh, let's say, 13,500 years ago, deliberately by an extraterrestrial called Semyasa, a, a male who procreated with an Earth human being to create what they termed an intelligent humanity on the earth because there were more primitive people there mm-hmm. in order that there could be a lineage of prophets who would come amongst the people and be teachers in the truth. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so you get this, you know, there's this list of names. And, of course, I don't just automatically assume that it's, everything's absolutely as I say it is, but just that there is that kind of detail is very satisfying. Uh, when you get such nebulous stories that never quite come together in the uh, traditional texts. It sort of, it, I mean, it certainly challenges the belief system, you know, of um, orthodox uh, believers on, in the Christian sense. And, and um, But, as I said, once you can get through oh. that sort of um, self-guilt of one possibly feeling like you've been tricked and two that sort of sense of paranoia because i mean you're going against the grain of the one you know one like the christian uh, faith or you know the belief of a planet oh, two billion more than two billion Christians. right right when you go against that and you and, and then things do make sense and you know even for me i still sort of like well what if what if what if but you know, once you get through that, it does become liberating. I mean, uh, the very first time that I came across the Talmud of Emmanuel was in 2006 on uh, September 21st. I remember the date because um, for long f- I was praying, and I, is, now I'm understanding before I thought it was a high power, but I was, uh, uh, through my own power of my own consciousness, I wanted to know the truth about this sort of thing, about, you know, God and um, you know, creation, I was supposed to say now, but back then it was about God. And I had a copy of the Talmud, of Emmanuel in my in my being, and uh, I opened it up and I read it from beginning to end, and I was totally engulfed in it, totally enthralled, and 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 at the end, uh, it said, um, you know, as I was reading it, sorry, I was like, going, oh, please give me some proof that this is right, this is right, and at the end, it said the mystery will be solved on September twenty first. It was nineteen ninety something, right? But it said September twenty first, and that was the very day I was reading it. Now for me, that was a personal revelation. Mm. 
you know, back then I thought, well, God put it in front of me so I could read it. But no, it was like I must have, like, through my own power of consciousness, either uh, I, I read the date somewhere before and uh, subconsciously I picked it up on the very date that it said in the book. However it occurred, it, it manifested right for me, for me to know the truth. For me, it was my own personal revelation, my own power of my own consciousness. Mm. So um, that was my discovery into this uh, whole angle of um, learning about the Talmud and, and the manual. And... Um, it was it was liberating. I mean, in, in the in the text that I had, though, I'm not sure how accurate it was or to the uh, you know to the original um, original English translation. But it was talk about celestial brothers and there was God, God, and God. So there was God with a lowercase G, God with a capital G, and and then there was creation. All right. So it That'd was be confusing still. Yeah, it was. It was. But um, I had to dissect it and um, uh, basically look it up and. Um, realize that that's when the first bit about creation was it just made sense you know mm. it was talking about reincarnation um and uh it, it was logical and the thing is that one thing that i do know that the the new testament says that god never changes and i suppose that that also means that the laws of creation never changes mm. and it has to be logical it has to be consistent so um nothing that changes in in those in those particular laws and therefore if that's the truth if those if things never change and it's consistent in its in its you know in that in that own right then to me that that's that does say the truth for me mm-hmm. and uh, and isn't it interesting that you sort of need the degrees in some ways uh, it, it can be helpful to have things that only went half the way of telling the truth because mm-hmm. it is a shock to the system um you know we do need our psyches to be protected from too much of a shock Yes. Well, what I found, it was just right enough for me at the very moment in time. I suppose if I read it again, like when it comes out later this year in English, I'll probably get, learn a little bit more and go, ah, that didn't make sense back then in 2006, so it makes sense now. Mm. Um, so it was exactly what I needed at the time, and I suppose because of my intent and, you know, my unconsciousness was prepared for it, you know, as I was really wanting to know that sort of information. Mm. So... Yeah, it's a, it's a phenomenal read, and um, we've only got a few minutes left, so I do recommend people. Have, where where would you um, like to send people? Um, right. To the website? We will be notifying. In fact, we should have copies of of the um, the Talmud Emmanuel in English when it is produced. Uh-huh. Um, so our site is au. dot Excellent, and that's uh, au. dot That's correct. So that's just our Australian group, and mm-hmm. it's actually the Canadian group, which is ca.figure.org, will actually be producing the book, printing the book, which is uh, currently being checked over in Switzerland. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, cool. Yes, so hopefully, hopefully, you know, around the end of the year that will be ready. And, mm-hmm. and please remember anyone who wants to learn, it's worth the wait because you're not really going to know which of the older versions is, is what parts of those is correct. Uh, mm-hmm. It really is just going to cause more confusion, so it's better to, to wait for, to the, wait for to the a proper, a properly approved version. <laughs> yes. But if people want to get an understanding about the teaching of the prophets, they can mm. go ahead uh, to the website and purchase Goblet of the Truth. The Goblet That's of right. The Truth. That's right. That's uh, right. And um, you know, if uh, if you can't afford it, then there is a PDF available on the website. Um, but there are other books. What's, uh, I think one's called um, Power of the Psyche? Or... Uh, well, there is The Psyche, which is one the produced Psyche, by the yeah. Canadian group. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's Might of the Thoughts. There's mm-hmm. uh, The Way to Live. Mm-hmm. Uh, what else have we got? Um, I'm going. I'm in trouble now if I haven't remembered them That's all. Okay. Okay. Um, but go and have a look. We've got we've got the available things, or, or we'll have shortly. Sometimes we run out of stock of the things that come from the United States. Do they have um, um, in the writings? Do they teach you how you can practice? I mean, it's not just knowledge of information oh, to say, no. okay, this is how it is. But are, are there techniques? Or yes, yeah, certainly, certainly. Your, okay. I mean. We've tried to put excerpts of various texts in our... So you can rummage around on our website. You might find some useful things. So there's little bits and pieces about meditation. Okay. Um, that's that's the most valuable one because only when you achieve that quietness of mind can you start to listen to the intuition that guides you in the right place. Everyone has this natural uh, inner voice that actually does... You know, the conscience, the inner voice, that right. actually does know the correct way to go, but you have to learn to listen to it. Right. Um, but you can't listen if you, you, your voice is full of chatter. So um, mm. it's that sort of thing. Um, but 
the way to live um, is absolutely full of, you know, things like um, you need time alone, but you also need company. Um, you know, you, you shouldn't remove yourself like a monk um, because you won't learn, you know, really how to live if you're constantly in a softened environment. Um, work is important um, because you're an instrument of creation, but obviously not to the point of exhaustion where you can't have time to contemplate. Right. Contemplate is really important. Um it's this sort of thing. It's not being overcrowded. It's one of those problems with overpopulation that it's if you don't have enough space for your own psychical well-being, that's going to impact on your ability to live and thrive and love and be a true human being. Mm -hmm. um, it's a hygiene, matters of hygiene, you know, washing. It's it's all at all levels, every, every level. So it's kind of practical and uh, for the mind and for the body. Yes. Um, for like the way of life or for living exactly. your life to, the, to its fullest potential and become a, uh, a creature of creation, a manifestation. And recognising that the thoughts that you think are actually influencing other people around you and, and everything. Um, so it's, yes, it's all of those things. Excellent. Well, I think the uh, we've come to the end of the show. Yes, we have. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Vivian, for joining us today. Thank you, Scarlett and Chris. Uh, thank you for joining us on today's show. Oh, thank you very much for having me, Rodrigo. Yeah, you're more than welcome. It's a great pleasure.